R. Bobby, top three car decades by market. Oh, okay. Yeah, the 1990s from Japan. Mm -hmm. Totally. That was when they were spending more money on the cars than they were making. And they made some of the funnest stuff they've ever made. Right. Uh, 60s muscle cars, U.S. Sure. in the 60s. First half, uh, ni- or 1995 to 2005 Italians. See, I go 2000 to 2010 because then you get the end of uh, the 550 and mm. the beginning of 458. Because 458 was like oh, okay. 09. Sure. You just get both. That is a fair assessment. <clears throat> What's up, folks? Welcome to the Smoke and Tire Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Viore. I love my Viore shirts. I'm wearing one right now. I got the Viore shorts for when I work out. I got the Viore hoodies. I cleaned that place out using my 20% off my first uh, purchase discount. These shirts are great. When I found these things and I bought my first one, I knew that it was the last shirt I ever wanted to wear, and I threw away 90% of my other shirts and replace them with Viore. All these shirts and shorts and pants are designed to work out in, but they don't look or feel like it. They're so comfortable. You want to wear it all the time, whether you're going to work, whether you wear it under a nice shirt when you're going out, whether you're going to yoga or going jogging. It's super versatile. It can be used for any activity. And it's just special. I don't know what it is about the strato fabric in their t-shirts, but when I wear them, you can't see sweat. And when it's hot out in California and I'm working up on the mountain in the desert, I got to stand in front of a camera, but then I got to work around a hot car and then I got to get in a hot car and I'm super self-conscious about feeling sweaty. And so these shirts hide sweat. It's great. It's designed to look great in everyday life for any workout activity. The website is super easily laid out, easy to use, and they are true to size, which I, I really like that. The double XL fits me perfectly. They're really durable. They last a long time. I've washed them a million times, and uh, they are great. The best-selling products are that men's core short, which is what I wear when I... Uh, use the elliptical machine at home or do Pilates and then the Sunday performance jogger. That is the perfect Zach Clapman pant. It's like a non-jeans. It's like athletic technical fabric, right? You wear them when you're like hiking or something. Or you can just wear it all the time. Viore is an investment in your happiness. And for our listeners, they are offering 20% off your first purchase. Get yourself some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet at viore.com slash TST. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash TST. Not only will you receive 20% off your first purchase, but enjoy free shipping on any U.S. orders over $75 and free returns. Viore.com slash TST, V-U-O-R-I.com slash TST, and discover the versatility of Viore clothing. Also brought to you today by Off the Record. We love Off the Record. They do a much, much needed service to the community. You know why? Because policing is not about keeping roads safe. It's about raising revenue and creating a revenue generating ecosystem for the police departments, the courts, and insurance companies at your expense. Never plead guilty. If you get pulled over and get a ticket, offtherecord.com slash TST or download the Off The Record app and use code TST10. That will get you 10% off all legal services from Off The Record. Off The Record are not lawyers. What they do is they connect you to a qualified lawyer in the area where you got that ticket They'll fight that ticket on your behalf, working to get those points off your record. And that's really important because it's one thing to just, if it was just paying a one-time fine, that would be one thing, but that's not what these tickets are. There's the fines, there's the court costs, and then there's the insurance companies that raise your rates possibly for as long as several years, meaning a ticket that you think is like $200 could really cost you thousands of dollars in the long term. Don't be a sucker. Don't plead guilty. Offtherecord.com slash TST or code TST10 on the Off The Record app. Get it now and be ready instead of having to think about this from the side of the road. 
All right, folks, today it's a crew show. I have gotten back from a trip through the Great Smoky Mountains in a Chrysler 300. We talk about some of the things I saw, did, ate, and drank on that trip, as well as an exploration of the interesting town of Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Who knows what's going on down there? We also talk a little bit about the Hummer EV without breaking embargo and what the IIHS could be doing to curb very heavy and very fast vehicles. We talk about why company towns are bad and people should learn their history. And we've got lots of questions from our Patreon involving many hypothetical and real situations. It's a crew show on today's Smoking Tire podcast. My body clock is fucked up. Like, this Saturday was a colossal body clock fuck up. Like, did this trip. And we can talk about it in a minute. I was planning on going to the airport at 4.30 a.m. in Knoxville. Woken up at 2 a.m. in Knoxville by a text alert saying my flight was canceled. So called Delta. And it was a Knoxville through Atlanta to L.A. Right. So we were like, can we just get on the Atlanta flight if we can make it? And they're like, yes. And they're like, we'll t- and we'll tell you what, we won't charge you extra. I'm like, how could you charge me extra? I'm taking one less flight. And they're like, well, the the flight from Atlanta to L.A. by itself is more expensive than the flight from Knoxville through Atlanta to L.A. I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. I I'm understand all- what they're saying, but like that doesn't make any sense. You're makes like, no you're sense. already on the flight. We're already on the flight. Yeah. How would you charge me? And you canceled this one. I'd perf- I'd be perfectly happy to fly from Knoxville to Atlanta. Yeah, put me on a Cessna. Yeah. And, and reduce the fare. Okay. So, two forty a.m. Get in the Chrysler three hundred rental car, and drive two hundred and forty miles to Atlanta. Three o'clock in the fucking morning. Two hundred and forty miles to Atlanta. That's like three and a half hours. Yep. Oh Got my there God. at six forty a.m. Uh. Got on the flight to uh, the eight eight twenty flight to from Atlanta to LAX. Landed at like eleven thirty a.m. Okay, I have it's I've now been awake for like twelve hours, and it's eleven thirty a.m. local time. And then you have to change the clocks that night, <laughs> so you lose another hour. So I woke up on Sunday like fucked, and I have been. What time did you go to sleep on Saturday? I like took like an PM. hour nap in the middle of the day and then went to bed at like 7 p.m. and slept 12 hours. Nice. And woke got right, up at good. 7 a.m. on – oh, no, it was 11 hours because the clock. And I woke up still tired. It was – it was that was like one of the longest travel days. That's pretty bad. Mm-hmm. That's real bad. A sudden four-hour drive in the middle of the night. That's really unexpected. <laughs> get out of bed at 2.40 in the morning and drive fucking hours. Oh, I mean, even if you had to just change the flight at 2 o'clock in the morning, you'd probably be awake because of the stress. Yeah, yeah. And then you're just awake till 6 a.m. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, the next flight, if I didn't want to do any of that, the next flight out of Knoxville where I could was like, was like that af- like 4 o'clock that afternoon. I wouldn't have yeah. gotten home till like midnight. It was like fucking, ugh, what a shit show. That's really bad. Yeah, it was sucked. <laughs> it definitely sucked. And then... And then Enterprise charged me four hundred and eighty dollars for returning the car in a different unexpected they forward city. Forward the bill to Delta. You know, if the magazine wasn't so. paying for it and of it was course. my own money, I would. But since I'm just passing along the billing to yeah. Road and Track, like I don't care. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not fighting for this four hundred bucks. I don't. I don't care that much. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a a surprise. Long drive ending to a <laughs> to an otherwise rather pleasant road trip. To be honest with you, uh, scouted the route for the uh, the road and track Smoky Six Hundred, which um, is sold out. We sold it out, which is really nice. Um, started and in, in, flew into Nashville. Collected. A, I wanted a Dodge Challenger V Six. They didn't have any of them. They only had a Chrysler Three Hundred V Six, which is mostly the same except not in one crucial way. There is no uh, manual controls for the gearbox. P-R-N-D-L, that's all you get. And no sport mode. No, no plus minus button? No plus minus buttons and no sport mode. So you, you have no, and, and L, all L does is it locks out any gear above three. 
So so that's what you got. Okay. Whereas like with a Chrysler, at least you could like or the Dodge, at least you could slide the thing over and have a little plus minus, you know, whatever. Otherwise, not a terrible rental car. You know, V6 base. 23,000 miles is kind of a lot for a rental car. It's the Pentastar, right? There's like a Pentastar. A solid V6. That's a good engine. It's a engine. fine V6. Yeah. yeah. Not exciting, but fine. I got I got reasonably good fuel economy. I, I wrote like 2,000 words about the road trip on Road and Track. You can go check that out if you like. Um, first day, two flat tires. No Not way. like flat, not blowout tow truck flat. Made it to the hotel, right? Came back out to go to dinner, and both right tires were like 12 PSI low. Like you went over something on the right side, like but a screw. Nail, like nails in both. Oh, shit. Nails in both. You drive through I, construction site on the I don't, So I don't know were if- Were you racing that kid from Fast and Furious yes, 3? Yes, 100%. Yeah. I, I, there was uh, the highway patrol. They threw a bunch of tacks on the fucking- <laughs> Try and stop me. <laughs> Kentucky. Smoke. smoke. The, sm- <laughs> the smoke the smoky got 600. You yeah, hit that button. They got me. So fortunately- um, I, I learned this by accident, but there was a Firestone, so I drove to a Firestone around the corner from the hotel, and it turns out that Firestone has a deal with Enterprise. And so if you bring an Enterprise car to a Firestone with a flat tire, they fix it and they just bill through to Enterprise. So I didn't have to pay That's anything, good. which is money. And um, shout out to Mark at Firestone, who was a fan, and who uh, apparently I taught to drive stick to. With oh, my cool. How to drive stick video. So Louisville Firestone, what up? Um, but now I had Bridgestone tires on the left and Firestone tires on the right. They did not replace all four because because Enterprise. Um, so what was the tread like on the old ones on the left side? Not horrible. It okay. was a different. Ver- it was a different tire. The tread wear was similar. The pattern was different. The size was the same. You didn't really know when to to drive it. You couldn't really tell the difference. It, it didn't pull left or right. Yeah, no, it, no, it was okay. okay. It was the the alignment wasn't super fucked. Like it was, it was fundamentally it was fine. Um, it would have had to be pretty bad for me to really give a shit. Yeah, because at this point it was like just I just need fucking tires. I'm in Louisville. Please help. I mean, me. If it's really bad, I wonder if they would just put the two new ones like two new ones in the front, older ones in the rear. I think there's that a slight they- stagger. I don't think I think there's a slight stagger even on the V6. I don't think it's a square stance. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think you can do that. But uh, yeah, went to the Louisville Slugger Museum. Hannah loved that shit. Mm. You know, Hannah loves a fucking and it's also the factory. It's where they make the bats. Okay. Great half hour of your time. If you're still the official bat of the. uh, Oh yeah. uh, Okay. Oh yeah. And uh, there's a there's a whole section where there's two machines that make the pro bats. And then all these other lesser machines that make the consumer grade bats. Uh, yeah, they're made like not the same. The wood is better for the pro bats. They get the they get the picks. They pick the wood better for those bats. The grain is lined up perfectly, and then everybody else gets the fucking irregular bats. Okay. Um, but uh, if you got a half hour in Louisville, it is worth your time to take the bat factory tour. Did you see a door cracked open with a bunch of cork in it? And you're like, oh, what's Bro, that? And you're like, nothing. Slam. Shady ass <laughs> weight reductions. Um, no, it would actually, it would have been, you, you, to cork a bat, it would be very tough using, sneaking in these in this factory. Because they're just milling it out of a big fucking dowel. Um, but that was pretty cool. And uh, went to Louisville, went to Lexington. Lexington is a nice place. Uh, small, but very progressive for Kentucky. I was surprised. You know, you think Kentucky, you don't really think that you're going to see a bunch of pride flags all over the place, but Hmm. Lexington is where you see such things. I think it's because the University of Kentucky is there. Well, if you sail across the ocean long enough, you find an island. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Good coffee, uh, decent, decent food. Good quality uh, craft cocktails at Harvey's Bar. Enjoyed that. And uh, Knoxville. Uh, love Knoxville. Very cool town. I'm, uh, Knoxville is probably my favorite town in that region. Um, very walkable. Lots of cool places to eat and drink and shop. Um, and uh, Tail the Dragon is south of Knoxville, which is uh, where, where, you know, the, that whole, the whole region, about an hour hour and a half south of Knoxville on the North Carolina border there uh, is where all the good driving is, right? Right where your mouse is, right there. 
That's Tail of the Dragon, where your mouse, right right to the left of your mouse is Tail of the Dragon there. Um, and you've got, like, uh, Cherahola Skyway, Blue Ridge Parkway. That's all right in that sort of triangle between um, Chattanooga and Knoxville and whatever the fuck's on the right there. 129, see Fontana yep. Dam? That's Tail of the Dragon right there. Oh, I've driven to that dam. Yeah, and the, Fontana yeah. Dam is good. Yeah, the, and the road off of Tail of the Dragon I thought was more fun just because it was... Yes. Uh, flowier and that's not the, as busy. That's the Cherahola Skyway and the 28. So those roads yeah. are going to be on our uh, on our route, which is nice. Hannah and I went to Pigeon Forge. You what know about that? Pigeon Forge? Is that where they make pigeons? It's on the top right of your screen there, just southeast of Knoxville. And uh, it's where Dollywood is. Oh. You know, Dolly Parton's uh, theme yeah. park. I've heard that is quite an experience. No joke. It, it actually is. Dollywood is good. I've been to Dollywood before. We didn't go this time, but one of the homies uh, who came on the route to Vine, Roden Track, owns a Alpine coaster uh, in Pigeon Forge. So Dollywood was cool. such a big deal that now all of Pigeon Forge is like side acts for... Like, look on the left. See iconic Pigeon Forge on the left? No, no on the on the oh, menu. Yeah. The, the Titanic Museum attraction, Dollywood oh, no. Splash Country. That place, Wonderworks, if you can see the photo there, that's in, like, an upside-down building. Laser tag. Look, look at the building is, like, upside oh, down. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, there's, Whoa. like, that whole road. What? Isn't that kind of crazy? I'm going to show this picture to the audience. That is... I mean, yeah, it's like take the clock tower from Back to the Future and, and turn like, it on And, like, flip it over. Head. Yeah, yeah. But there's, Whoa. like, there's a... It's, like... Really it would be a great place to eat some mushrooms and wander around because there's a bunch of these fucking crazy buildings like this with like one with like King Kong off it. There's like a two thirds scale Titanic replica there. And there's just all this like it's like it's like Vegas, but like also kind of conservative and family friendly. You know what I mean? Like, uh, there's no gambling and stuff. Like there's that. no gambling. Right. No, there's, but there's, there's no stripper. There's like the like pamphlets. the Hatfield and McCoy's dinner theater and some weird magic shows and these kind of haunted house things and like funky side attractions. That whole street, all of the, all the weird shit on that street. If you go, especially look south, there's there's zip lines, right? There's like. The weird snow park, even though there's no snow there. There's the wax museum and the fucking, all this other shit um, is kind of crazy. And there's multiple Trump stores, like stores that just sell Trump, Trump merch, yeah. shit. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was pretty crazy. This, the Rocky, shout out to the Rocky Top Mountain Coaster. Quality mountain coaster. Four uphills. Had four different uphills. Oh, sorry, I was getting mixed up with the Alpine coaster, mountain the, the actual Al roller coaster you're talking no, about. No, no, no. This it's, it it is it is an Alpine coaster where you have a, a cart that has brakes on it, but it's called the Rocky Top Mountain Coaster. That's the one. And it has uphills to. that like you get on a you get platform pulled up that brings like, you back up. Yeah, you get pulled up That's like cool. a roller coaster. That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty sweet. Was the um, uh, Dolly Parton Pillow Factory? Did dude, there's that. Town Pigeon Forge is full of some wonky ass shit. Well, yeah. There's the Zorb, the Zorb thing. There's all oh, kinds yeah. of fucking weird stuff down there. It's a great way to get your just kid to driving up. on that north south road out of town. You, we, the building, go to Street View. Just pick anywhere on there and go to a Street View, and I bet you see some like some weird fucking building somewhere. Uh, I picked the wrong spot, I guess. But like, there's trust me, there's some weird shit on that street. Um, the Dolly Parton bra slingshot. Yeah, dude. So, uh, and then, it, but that area, so like in Kentucky, the roads are kind of like rolling farmlands, you know, cows grazing and stuff like that. Uh, you kind of, you know, there's the Titanic, Titanic. the Titanic thing the street there. The, that would be funny is if the Titanic replica is as big as the Noah's Ark replica. I don't know where that is. I can't remember which state, but I just saw a video about it the other day. It'd be funny if they're the same size. It's it's big. There's I mean, it's a, very big, and there's there's lots of King Kong. I mean, yeah, <laughs> they're looking look, huge, Titanic. Yeah, people watching on uh, live on Patreon right now are looking. At, they have a, they made a fake iceberg next to the fake Titanic. Yep. That is funny. And um, what happens if it hits the iceberg, Dad? Don't worry about it. I liked the roads. 
Kentucky wasn't bad. I was really impressed at Kentucky's tarmac quality. Yeah, it's good. Their, their tarm. I expected Tennessee's to be very good. I've been driving in Tennessee before. Um, Tennessee is like is a is if you're not if you're not like in California or Colorado, Tennessee is probably the next best place to drive in America. The the Smoky Mountains are amazing. But I, uh, Kentucky was better than I thought it was going to be. It was because we went to Kentucky for the bourbon mainly, uh, and because on the road and track things we have to have a track. That's part of the shtick, and so we're using NCM. It's the only track around. There's yeah. no other tracks. Yeah, uh, they're building a track uh, outside of Knoxville. So if we get to do this again next year, there'll be a track there which we can use, which will make our overall route. I think better. Oh, okay. Um, but we got multiple distilleries. Buffalo Trace has changed a lot since we were there last time. Oh, wow. We were it's, there in like 2015? I think it was maybe? 14 or 15. Okay. It's way bigger. Jeez. Way bigger now. The, the gift shop is way bigger. The the tours are, are like, there's so many more buildings. The parking lot is way bigger. The gift shop was really small when we went. Yeah, it's like, huge I, now. Like the, the grounds were large when you drove in. But I remember the gift shop was like, the size of your lounge here? It, it was very, it was like, here's yeah. some bottles and some bottles and a shirt, I guess? And it's, that was it. The gift shop now is probably 2,500 square feet. It's huge. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I went to this place, Whiskey Thief, which I really liked because you can't buy <coughs> the booze anywhere at retail. They don't sell it online. You can't buy it in stores. You can only get it there. And they, when they do tastings, they do it. They have barrels laid out on the floor and they pull the whiskey out of the barrel and into your glass. And you taste it out of the barrel. And if you go, oh, I like barrel number three, they go, okay. And and if you go, I want a bottle of that, they'll they'll make you a bottle right Whoa. there and slap a label on it. And that's the only place you can buy the bottles, which is pretty cool. That is very cool. So that's one of the stops. Uh, and then we're going to Woodford Reserve also, which is pretty. Um, but I was very impressed with the quality of tarmac in Kentucky. It was very good. Which was a surprise to me. I don't know why I expect. I didn't expect it to be good, but well, I think their weather is fairly mild. Mm -hmm. Like they don't have lots of snow and then lots of. I mean, it gets hot there, but that yeah. helps keep the road from like cracking and splitting. And they also don't have earthquakes. And maybe if heavy trucks don't go on those canyon roads, they don't that go helps on the too. windy roads. Yeah, we were yeah. staying off the highways mostly, so it was nice. Uh, but man, that Chrysler three hundred. That shit feels old. Guys, we got to take a quick break from this show because NASCAR is heading back to the East Coast and racing at Atlanta Motor Speedway. With a handful of races now under these driver's belts, the competition is starting to heat up. One of the drivers we've got our eyes on this weekend is the local Georgia product, Chase Elliott. He's one of NASCAR's most popular drivers and consistently at the top of the overall standings, but has yet to find himself in victory lane this year. Will this be his week to take home the checker and cement his spot in the 2023 NASCAR playoffs? Don't miss out on the action. Make sure you tune in to the NASCAR Cup Series race Sunday, March 19th at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Pacific on Fox. Man, that Chrysler 300, that shit feels old. It is. Man, it's an old, old car. Didn't we look it up? That platform was from like the early, oh, early 2000s. Oh, yeah. Well, the, as a Chrysler. And yeah. then before that, it was the 124 Mercedes E-Class. It's an old fucking car. Yeah. Like, and they, they, I know they refreshed it in like 2015. But they didn't but, refresh under. They refreshed the right, bodywork. Yeah, yeah. It's not an all new car. No. It's just the bodywork. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, it was good that like, I don't. How many miles were on your rental car? 23,000. Wow. It's a lot for a rental car. It didn't smell. That's good. It had lumbar support, had lots of leg room, and it had the something that I really love, which is when the seat goes really far back so I can stretch my legs out, but then the steering wheel telescopes really far out. Mm. I love that because I got long legs and short arms. Right. And so I can sit far back and still have kind of a relaxed hand position. By the end of that drive to Atlanta, though, that last day, my fucking hands hurt so bad. Just from so much driving, oh. my hands were killing me. How many hours did you do per day? I want to say it was probably four hours a day. But the last day, not the one to drive to Atlanta, when I went from Knoxville, Tail of the Dragon, Cherahola Skyway, and then all the way back to Knoxville, that was probably five hours of back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. It was, it was a lot of hand over hand. My hands were just really fucking done after and that. Did, and you did that for five days, right? Yeah, Monday it was a through, lot of yeah. driving. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went to the gym this morning for the first time since I got back, and I was like, oh, this is my, I am out of fucking, out of shape. Not good. Um, but the trip is going to be really nice. The hotels are cool. Uh, our hotel in Knoxville had the speakeasy in it. There was, you need a password to get in, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm, that's fun. Some good restaurants and, and uh, good, good walking around. Went to one of those old timey soda fountain places in Knoxville called the Phoenix Pharmacy that had like crazy ice cream sundaes, but also was making Coca-Cola like they made it in like 1905. Where you, they'd like have they a, really made it in 1905? Not with the yayo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you had to bring your own yayo and sneak it in. All recipes got <laughs> some pep. But they would do it was two pumps of the syrup, and then the, the and fucking then, right. seltzer gun. Yeah. It didn't okay. taste quite like regular Coca-Cola. But, of course. Yeah. But it's good and fun, right? Mm-hmm. You sit at the counter and eat a Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Pretty dank. I was about that Sunday. It was very, very good. Um, what else did I write down? The Corvette Museum we went to in Bowling mm-hmm. Green. Mm-hmm. I thought... I misunderstood. I thought when they when they had the sinkhole that they kind of left the sinkhole but built a support structure so you could kind of look down. They didn't do that. We filled in the sinkhole. So the sinkhole's gone. Oh, it is? Yeah, it's it gone. It was there for a while. Yeah, no, oh, not while they were open. Did they make a fake sinkhole? That they, we, that there's we a, saw a, there's a we display. Saw a there's a sinkhole display. How big? What do you mean? It's not a real hole. Okay, but it is car sized or mm, no. I swear to God we went there in like twenty fourteen, right after the hole had happened, and saw like the hole the hole and they put cars in it and they were like, Yeah, let's just own this. But maybe they, they, may maybe they had to take maybe they had to fill it for safety or uh, something. they may have done that while God. they were figuring out how to fix it. And you could look at it from the side. It was inside that cone structure. You could look down at it. In the cone structure. I think yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like the, it's filled in now, okay. and there's like tape on the floor showing where the outline of the of it was. The cave in exhibit. Oh, they have security cameras. Yeah, the, they now have a cave in exhibit, gotcha. which kind of like shows what where it was and what what was going on. But like, you can't you can't go in that room where the sinkhole was it is now flat floor. They filled it all in underneath with concrete and rocks gotcha. and shit. Because this is the real hole. Right? Yeah, yeah, we're that's the whole. Right yeah, yeah, but it, for... but I'm just saying it doesn't gotcha. look like that. Now. I totally get get you. Yeah. Okay. There may have been a time after the hole happened that they allowed people in that room to like look, but it's not like that anymore. Okay. But there are some cool Corvettes. I mean, there are some cool. They they got a bunch of the Mako Shark concept and a bunch of the race cars from the 50s and 60s and plus the tracks across the street. NCM, the track right? is across the street. And that's a good track. If, yeah, if, yeah. If, you, if someone's going to take a trip to the museum, try to do it on a day where there's a track day available, too. Yeah. Um, so it's it was a cool trip. I think I think people uh, who go on this one will will enjoy it. One thing that did bum me out about the sinkhole, on top of the fact that they're, the sinkhole itself is gone, is that the only cars that they had that were in the sinkhole, they fixed like they didn't leave them fucked up. Oh, like yeah, that image you've got right there to the right, the one to the right. Mm. Uh, no, D- down, down one. Sorry, there, that one. Oh, see that? See right there in that photo, it looks like at some point people were allowed to see cars that were damaged. That yeah. looks. See, there's like there's like c- cones and tape. Right. And also, it looks like people were at some point allowed in that room, along with damaged cars. And this is for people listening. Like all the cars are back out of the hole. They're parked next to each other, and they have dust on them, smashed windshields. Yeah. So. And the story there says one year ago today. So I'm guessing that was while they engineered the fix. Right. And they have since fixed the cars and fixed the hole. And so that w- I think they should have left the fucking hole even though it maybe was dangerous. Yeah, and it also removed a lot of the floor space that they like to use for things. Probably. You know? Yeah. Um, it was quite wide, but yeah, they're going to leave five cars unrestored and fill it up. Okay. There uh, you know you can take delivery of your Corvette at the at the Corvette Museum. They have like an area for new car deliveries mm-hmm. and they have uh, released some in-house aftermarket parts that you can get now. And they'll either put them, they'll install them for you. So somebody was, there was a couple, you know, a couple C8s there getting 
dusted off, ready to get delivered, and it was like, congratulations, Max Stevens, your new C8, blah, 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 and congratulations, Dave Smith, for your new Z06 over here. They hit a little sign. And then there was one thing that had, like, C8R badges all over it, and it turns out it was just, like, accessories they put on this car, and it looked stupid as uh, hell. It, someone, they didn't buy a race car. They did not buy a race car. Okay. There's just, like side skirts that say C8R and like bigger side scoops that said C8R and like a long ass front splitter that says C8R on it like it's just like I mean unless random you're ass using it as a dedicated track car and, and that's, that's legit all, arrow otherwise it's just, no, it's just posturing that's weird mm-hmm. it was weird it's hard to get in driveways you've made your car worse but like I thought you had to do, wait till you took your car home to put ugly shit like that on it turns out they'll do it for you right. before you even take delivery I mean if they print the catalog in the back you know they just might <laughs> they were well, in yeah. the gift shop they were selling those parts on the wall wow it was like C8R front splitter $355 like whatever the fuck they gotta modernize that gift shop down there that gift shop is the fucking boomerish shit ever well, it's a Corvette gift shop. Obviously, though. like I mean, they're still. selling splitters on the wall. I, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they need to change it because yeah. people probably walk through and they see the cars from the museum. And like, oh, that does look cool. And then you turn and you're like, oh, there's the splitter. I just said look cool, and they're like, we got gotcha. you. But Hannah was like looking through the gift shop, and she was like, she's like, I thought like I thought with these new Corvettes, they look more like you know Ferraris now, and like younger people are buying them. And I'm like, younger people are buying them. But older people are coming to the museum. <laughs> like yeah. The young people who are buying Corvettes are not going to the museum. I think the younger people buying C8s are going to get into something new and different a year from now or a year from now. Or you know, I, yeah, I think yeah. they're just like, it's oh, this stepping, is a hot new it's thing. It's a stepping stone. And they're not going to gonna keep them. They're not necessarily Corvette people. Yeah. Yeah. Someone mentioned, did you, did you see the Lane Museum? It's in Nashville. Lane uh, we Museum? did not. We were okay. Nashville isn't part of the um, the trip. The trip actually starts in Bowling Green. So we went to Nashville and we had dinner with Cameron and Whitney Weiss, which was very nice, um, at Sean Brock's restaurant. Audrey, you know Sean Brock. Mm-mm. We went to his old restaurant, Husk. But oh, we went yeah. there. That was really he was good. executive chef there. He left. He now has his own restaurant. So there's two episodes of Bourdain about this guy. Whoa. About Sean Brock. And his this place, Audrey in Nashville, fuck me, was it good? It was excellent. Really, really good. Uh, so we had dinner there. Um, Cameron and Whitney, the the watchmakers, Weiss Watch Company, uh, they're friends with him. And they set up shop in Nashville. Now, Cameron's house is fucking dope. They got chickens. Nice. They got ducks. Uh, they got a fucking rooster. They got like a barn cat down there. Um, it, they got all these garden beds. There's That's like a so whole. Rad. There's a whole vibe going on down yeah, there. Yeah, they have space. Yeah, yeah. And they're they're getting like eight eggs a day from these chickens. That's so, man, that was the best eggs ever. That's so cool. That's great. Yeah, they're into it. Um, I had a customer service call. Did I tell you this? I called like Frontier someone uh, like a month ago, and I'm just talking to the person, and I couldn't tell where they were from based on their voice or accent. I had zero idea. It's just customer service. And then like ten minutes in, I hear, and I go. Do you have chickens? And, there, and it was a, a man. He's like, uh, yeah. And he didn't want to have a talk conversation with me at all. But I was like, oh, man, I'm so jealous. You have all this space. Do you get eggs every day? He's like, uh, yeah. Oh, so he was just work from home He was work chickens. from home customer service for tech support, but he had chickens in the backyard. That's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, is that a, uh, is that a chicken? <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, reset your router. We went to, uh, we went out, we were like, we want to walk. We stayed downtown Nashville, so we want to see, like, that Broadway street where all the fucking country stars have their bars. There's, like, the the Kid Rock bar and the Miranda oh, yeah. Lambert bar and the Toby Keith bar. And, uh, and uh, God damn, is that on a Monday? That is the trashiest street. Because <laughs> it's empty? No. It's popping off, oh. but just... Just every one of those places is exactly the same, playing the same fucking music, mm-hmm. just the same like neon beer signs, and it's just it was pretty. It's like uh, New Orleans, like Bourbon Street, but kinda, for country music, yeah, yeah or or, or like uh, Sixth Street in Austin, mm-hmm. but like more like honky tonky than that. It was it was like oof, this place, not it oh, was not, not your style. It was not for me. Yeah, but you know our friend. Uh, our friend works for uh, Justin Timberlake, who owns uh, what is probably 
the nicest of those. It's called the 1230 Club. So they they called the people and they got Hannah and I a table there, which probably wasn't necessary because it wasn't that busy. But that was nice. That one was, I was kind of into that one. What, nice. they, what were they playing music-wise? It was like it was like jazz, honestly, and we were kind of making fun of the of the jazz musicians who seemed to be, you know, uh, not not bored, but like just kind of like they they looked like they were playing a corporate gig, basically. Right. Yeah, they're fun. Uh, but it was it's a, a Monday. It was a yeah. nice spot. It was a yeah. It was yeah, a there's Monday. no vibe happening. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Knoxville's my jam, though. I was in I was in Knoxville. That did you go to Hattie like, B's for chicken? We did not. I had a lot of time in the car. I wasn't prepared to rupture my colon in a Chrysler 300. Don't eat spicy fried chicken while you burn zero calories. Bro, yeah. yeah. It's so good. I saw it. It was uh, it was right next to uh, to Timberlake's place. It was the the uh, I don't know if that's the original one, but there is one that's right there. It was fucking popping off too at midnight. Dude, Thad and I went once, and the line was out the door, and it was raining. Mm -hmm. Like, and we we and other people stood in the rain and just just was rain it worth it? it? Oh yeah! It oh was? my god, it was so good. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Next like, time. Like we ate half a chicken. <laughs> Next Goddamn, time was it good? Yeah. Um, but uh, nice road trip. Otherwise, other than that. Uh, other than blowing two tires out in Louisville, that was mildly annoying, but it was handled. I mean, it's it's nice it got handled really quickly. And yeah, I have yeah. that partnership. Yeah, and I'm glad it wasn't a blowout on the side of the road, and I could at least drive the car to the fucking spot. Right. Yeah. Ubers come crazy fast in Louisville. I called an Uber to get back to our hotel from Firestone. It was there in like two minutes. Called an Uber to get back to pick up the car later. It was. I mean, I've never seen Ubers come so fast. It was awesome. A lot of uh, high supply. Otherwise, Louisville, kind of a sad place. There's like one one block where it, sort of everything is, and you go you go away from that block and it deteriorates kind of rapidly. Mm. I'm sure there's some nice stuff somewhere in Louisville, and the people we talked to were were nice, but like it didn't didn't seem like there was a lot going on there. I wonder what. Like we looked main... up the list of like things to do in Louisville, and like the Bat Factory was number one by far. <laughs> there's a lot of distilleries there. You could, if you if you really want to drink, there's a there's like we were on like Whiskey Row. There's probably like ten or distilleries there. Um, so it's it's a bourbon town for sure. I mean, Louisville is the hub for food and beverage companies. So it's a lot of like office business. It's what it then, was. Yeah. It was a little. It was a lot of corporate right. shit. Yeah. Um, what did you do while I was gone? I drove the Hummer SUV. Oh, but I can't talk about it until March twenty third. Oh, the that's next, is that next week? That's next week. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. So, I'm sure it was enormously different from the truck. It the was roof, enormous. The roof made it. <laughs> the roof makes it way different. Well, I never drove the truck, but uh, people on the launch had did drive, had drove both. Uh -huh. So I, I got their perspective, which I guess I should also not share until March 23rd. Probably so, not. You know, the the downside, of course, which was public, is they wouldn't let us off road it on the off road track that they'd made because the rain, according to them. The rain had been so heavy all week that it had made it like silty clay. I don't know if they were, I don't know if they were worried we were gonna get the trucks stuck or break them or what, but mm -hmm. they wouldn't let anyone on any wave last week drive on the off road trail. That's awesome. That was good. Yeah, yeah that's that awesome. Was a real part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um their, the consolation well, prize, I'll tease it for next week. Like, I'll, I'll wait to tell you till next week, but their consolation prize, their problem fix for, hey, we can't let you drive this over here, but we'll let you do this thing over here, is very funny. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell me next week. Uh, did you see that uh, Tesla's thinking about opening a company town? A what? <laughs> Elon Musk said he's going to build a city for his workers to live and work in. Wait, who did that like 80 years ago? Uh, a bunch of people, and it's gone <laughs> real fucking bad every time. Right? That's how you keep the money in the town. Yes. There's, yeah. there's a whole unbelievable there's so many history. About it. <laughs> there's multiple dollops about it. There is like, if, if, you, if you do this, you do not know anything about history because it's gone horribly every fucking time. It's not, it's not good. Ooh, I mean, the top result. Mm -hmm. I, t I typed in Company Town History. Mm -hmm. Top result is a PBS documentary that is called Company Towns Themes Slavery by Another Name. 
<laughs> that is the top result on Google. That's basically what happens. Um, yeah. But basically, it is, it's a town where practically all stores and housing are owned by one company that is also the main employer. Right. Yeah. So basically, you pay your employees, and then they give all the money back to your businesses. They pay you rent or they whatever, and, that, and your money just swirls around. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's really, really bad. It's uh, just that 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 I thought that was funny that I that I read that and I do recommend looking up. Oh, Pullman! That's how we fucking know it, dude. In Illinois, Pullman, the 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 train car company, they had a company town, which was a uh, a real problem, right? Oh, Hershey, Pennsylvania, Five. that was another one. Yep. Uh huh. Was the problem with Hershey? Was it because of the coal thing underneath? Is that or is that a different part? Oh, that was where it burnt. The underground. There's like burning. an underground fire. Yeah, that's still, it's going. still going. Yeah. Okay. Different. Place. No, the Pullman. The dollop about Pullman was insane. Oh, speaking of which, did you listen to the PG and E dollop? Oh, it's just, you want to well, fucking? I saw, when I see two parts, I'm like, I don't have time, dude. With the PG and E one, you just want to fucking smash your head into the wall. It was. Oh, uh, yeah. Hershey, Pennsylvania. Steinway Village. Steinway Village. Yep. That's uh, that's not great, and uh, oh the the Roblings, yep, that's the bridge builders, yep, remember that one, and uh, Scotia, California, Pacific Lumber, that was a bad one too. Yup, and now Tesla. Maybe it's Maybe. I I mean, one hopes that somebody down there has been like, um, there's a history of this going really fucking bad. Yeah. But there's always – there's so many industries where there's something that happened 90 years ago and then the new version ha of it happens. Whether or not they know about the past version, they yeah. you know they either think, well, I'm going to do it different or they don't know about it. So – Yeah. Uh, on a positive note, mm -hmm. um, they might – There's a positive note? They might – Tell companies that they need better brakes and crash standards for big, heavy, fast oh, uh, EVs. This is that would cool. be awesome. So, um, where did it go? The guy who's in charge of the IIHS, uh huh, uh, Vice President uh, Ar Raul Arbelas. Arbelas. Um Basically, th what they they were testing their crash equipment to make sure it was up to snuff for these new heavy vehicles. So they took an old truck, filled it with a bunch of shit, yeah. so it was 9,500 pounds, and then they crashed it in all the different ways. Uh -huh. And they went, all right, our gear will withstand these impacts. But it helped because it made them look at, well, what is this going to do to small cars when they have an accident? Sure. And, uh, and the way he had put it was, yeah, today's supersized EVs are a double whammy of weight and horsepower. Mm -hmm. um, so. There may be, we may have a need for additional crash structures integrated into the EV to protect passengers in other lighter vehicles, yes. um, which is very cool. Yes. That's very cool. And it comes at the expense of people in other vehicles. Yes, that's called common sense. And also uh, pedestrians. Yeah. Um, do, do, do. Yeah. The I mean, easy, they didn't make a rule the last yet. last paragraph just, says the easiest suggestion to get alarmed about is when he writes states and local governments should consider lowering speed limits, factoring in the increased danger from weight disparities, and backing them up with increased enforcement. That's not that, good. That's not good. That's not that's not what we need. We don't need to lower speed limits, except in in within towns, maybe. I mean, we don't need to build more like four lane non like service roads. Like you know what I mean? Like if mm. we if we have a a, a a a small town, sure, but we don't need to lower the speed limit to forty five or fifty five on the freeway. That's not what we're talking about here. But there should be a major tax on overweight and overpowered vehicles, you pay the cost to be the boss. You want to drive a fucking Hummer or a Rivian, you should pay for the potential damage that your vehicle can cause in a crash. Yeah, because you can't get... The braking thing was interesting um, because, you know, like the Urus. Urus has 17-inch calipers, mm -hmm. right? 17-inch rotors, 17 sorry. 17.4. So how much bigger can a rotor get with the size of wheels there are today? Like, not really that much bigger. Like, I don't know if braking force can be increased unless you had axle brakes working in unison mm -hmm. with traditional rotors. So, like, that wouldn't necessarily work. Well, how, but, do we know how big the brakes are in the Hummer? 
uh, 14 something. Well, so they can get bigger than that. They definitely can. <laughs> they can yeah. certainly be bigger than that. Yeah, I think they use the same brakes whether you get the off the 18 inch off road wheels or the 22 that inch wheels. That probably makes sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, it doesn't it, make sense, right. but I understand that they have one set of brakes that doesn't change with your yeah, wheels. Yeah, but I wish I wish they, I, I told them, I was like, you guys should have a carbon ceramic option because this thing is so fast. Yeah. You know, if someone gets the big wheels. Well, well I don't know if a carbon ceramic tires. would change it, but maybe if it had two calipers. Or, or just larger you know, rotor for double, sure. Or larger you mean, rotor. If you go to a 17 or a, a inch more, rotor. You know, is it a 10 piston or something at least? I don't know. Yeah, it would have to be. It, you need you really need great great brakes for something that's that heavy it yeah. can go that fast yeah it's not like it's a box truck where you can't really go over 60 in this thing Dude, that, it weighs 50 percent more than an urus that's right crazy. like an urus is six thousand pounds yeah yeah high so, fives, and it's not yeah. just hummer like rivian also yeah. nine thousand pounds like any of these huge evs they're really heavy yeah it's wild it's so dumb yeah i mean what's the word the the ford lightning way it's probably around that it's lighter. Maybe. The Lightning's lighter. lighter. Than the yeah, it it's lighter than the Rivian because it doesn't have all that extra shit, and it's only got it's got two motors, not fucking three, three, six thousand pounds. Yeah. Whoa! The Lightning's wow. lighter. It's way lighter. Way lighter. Yeah. Rivian, where'd all the weight go? <laughs> <laughs> that makes you wonder. I mean, air suspension, okay. Air suspension, extra motors. I think the Rivian has a bigger battery Rivian. pack than the Lightning. How many motors does the Rivian have? I forget. It's. I want to say it's three, but it might be four. Oh, the Rivian might yeah, have four motors. Uh, Rivian R1T is powered by two or four, depending. On yeah. The yeah. So four with one for each wheel. That's going to yeah. weigh a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm glad they're like doing something, but whenever they say, it, it always seems like they're three steps behind. You know, they never like because you don't have to. It, approve this stuff before you release it to the public there always seems like well we're looking into solutions and there's never like uh you can't actually do this because it's not safe well i think they have they have criteria that's been around for a long time of like well your your vehicle needs to be able to withstand x amount of force in a you know hitting a wall at this angle or a wall at that angle or getting t-boned but maybe they maybe they don't have a standard and i don't know so if i'm wrong correct me in the comments but maybe they don't have a standard of how much damage can your vehicle do to another vehicle yeah you know no the the, the standards have always been designed to protect people inside the vehicle right there, in vehicle there is a, not, not really a standard for what do you what damage can you do to other shit maybe yeah, yeah. hmm there, there is in Europe. I mean, I don't think, I don't think pedestrian impact standards have really made it to America. I think that's all Europe. And so, car, car companies that want to sell their cars globally have to adhere to the European standard because they're not going to design two different cars, one for right. America and one for Europe. But if they don't sell, care about selling a car globally, then there's no standard really. So, you know, we're living in the, the evolutionary time. But it's for the same thing with the Internet and, and with Bitcoin and with all kinds of stuff where they just do this shit. And then the, the regulations are always super, super slow to keep up. Well, yeah, it wasn't always like that. The speed of technology has improved. That's helped. But I think there's always been people that I think laws usually get created because someone was doing something that is then deemed, oh, we shouldn't have that. Yeah. Like, like a company town. Company town or <laughs> like people that could corner the market in the yeah. 30s before they said, actually, you're not allowed to do this, like, you know, J.P. Morgan and them. Right. Before they got rid of those laws. Right. So before they made the law, they <laughs> before were. Before they made the law. <laughs> and then before they got rid of the right. law. Yeah. Um, Germany forms alliance against phased out of internal combustion engines by 2035. Yeah. I'm not surprised about that. I, I, I think the internal combustion engine is not done. And I think there's plenty of use cases for it. Mm -hmm. And it's more efficient now than it's ever been. Yeah. There was a guy who was trying to argue with me on Twitter that he thinks California is going to not renew registrations for collectible vehicles that were built between 1975 and you know, 1995 or something, between smog and OBD2. Mm. He thinks the he, he he was convinced that they were going to not renew those registrations, which I thought was ridiculous because you could drive a fucking Model T down the road in in, in California right now. They're not, they're not, they can't. They well, I, they could, but no governor or government 
would just cancel the registration for an existing collector car that's on the road. Yeah, probably not. I mean, it's the number is so small. Uh, it's so small, it makes such a little difference. It's, yeah. But regarding internal combustion engines, they, they're working on these carbon neutral fuels. They're running on working on synthetic fuels. And I think there's still there's still ways to make those engines efficient. Small hybrids, you know, battery pack yep. hybrids can make those. You could you could double the fuel economy of an internal combustion car, and and until we build up the infrastructure and figure out how to get these metals in a ethical way, we could make our supply of metals last a lot longer if we start building hybrids. Yeah, you know. Uh, what do we have on the Patreon? Of course, patreon.com slash the Smoking Tire Podcast. Ask us questions. Uh, you get our, our show ad-free. If you're a championship tier, you get our sh- our car review videos ad-free as well. And get them a little early sometimes if there's no embargo. Uh, you can get them as soon as Zach's done editing them rather than waiting till the regular uh, time. Lots of new patrons uh, since we added that championship tier. So welcome to you. We got a lot of questions mm-hmm. today, and we will try to get to them all. Um, oh, shit. This one is from Brian and uh, was asking. This was going to be a main segment, but I didn't get around to writing it. Okay. I forgot. Can we? Uh, we save. We save that one, but I actually want to write it out for Brian's. Okay. Tim says, uh, wants to know about. The Tag Heuer Formula One watch. That's an interesting watch with a very interesting history. It was one of the first watches that incorporated fiberglass. Uh, and he wants to, Tim wants to know about watch bands. It depends what you want your watch band to be made out of. You've got your NATO strap, which is a, a technical fabric, a cloth. You can get aftermarket bracelets, like uh, from... Uh, there's a bunch of different uh, options you can get from places like... Uncle Seiko and Strap Code. Strap Code makes some great uh, bracelets. Now, I don't know what you can get leather options. Basically, what you need to know is the lug width of that watch, which you should be able to find just by Googling the specs. I don't know what generation. There's like been four or five generations of Tag Formula One, so I'm not sure which you've got. But um, Under the Cuff makes a great cloth NATO strap. There's lots of uh, leather options. I get my leather bands from the Strap Tailor out of England. They take a while to get, but uh, they're great. Also, Bosphorus straps mm-hmm. out of Turkey. I really like them. And uh, Strap Code has really good aftermarket bracelets if you want a metal bracelet. Lucas says, do either of you have uh, recurring car-related dreams? I have a recurring stress dream that I can't break whatever car I'm backing up and end up hitting a small object. I think Lucas is a valet, (laughs) if I had to guess. I don't have any recurring dreams. The past couple days, I've had some real fucking... I had five or six different dreams last night. None of them really involved cars, but in one of them I was carrying my camera case through an airport and there was inexplicably a gun in it. I don't know why. <laughs> Couldn't tell you. Well, I th- I mean in in my experience a recurring dream like I used to have I used to have server nightmares all the time and it's a common thing with waiters or you know server staff. It's like whatever would stress you out the most and and is common in your life. So you travel a lot. So your ultimate fear would be like getting delayed or getting in trouble at the airport. Mm-hmm. So gun. Mm-hmm. So, but I don't have I don't have recurring car related dreams because I'm yeah. not constantly terrified of like something happening with the car. Yeah, I'm not either. I'm pretty confident with my my car care and control situation. So I can't. I don't know about any recurring dreams I've really ever had. I only started having dreams recently when I was smoking weed. I didn't have dreams, and I really enjoyed that. I don't like my dreams. I don't. I don't get anything out of them. They really just bug me out. Oh, um, yeah, sometimes they're fun. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have very good dreams. It's probably because I have very low self-esteem. Mm. Um, Miles Lark is looking at an ATSV as a daily driver in the Pacific Northwest. Has a short commute. Looking for a daily that can double double as a all year round canyon carver in the mountains. Thirty five thousand to forty five thousand budget. Taking Q out of the equation, is this a good choice? Uh, should I consider something all-wheel drive, or is rear-wheel drive combined with snow ice mode enough for bad conditions? Uh, what should I compare it to? Nothing German. Well, 
Your options are limited if you're saying nothing German. I mean, that's a lot of cars. Uh, how do you, I don't know how you take Q out of the equation because it is. If you don't hate it, I guess you can take it out of the equation. I mean, Q is fucked. It's really and it's hard not. To use. Someone asked me about. I don't know if this is the same person that DM'd me asking about the ATSV yesterday. Someone DM'd me yesterday asking about mm. ATSV, and I said Q is horrible. And they go, but what if I just what if I use Android Auto? But it's not the software that's horrible. It's the haptic buttons and the sliders right. that are horrible. Which you, you need for you can't get rid of those. Air the conditioning, climate, control, climate, and volume. Volume. Yeah, yeah, you cannot get rid of those. So I don't know how you take it out of the equation, but let's assume you're fine with it. So is it a good car dynamically? It's a yeah. pretty good car dynamically. Yeah. The engine isn't that interesting. It makes good power. It doesn't sound very good. Right. It's not a Revy engine. Right. But... The chassis, I think, is very good and rigid. The steering was pretty good. Like the chassis it, it's, is good. It's a good, responsive car. Yeah, and if you get, for, I don't know about snow ice mode, but certainly snow winter tires. Yeah, would help a lot. Yeah, it'd be fun. Do you need all wheel drive? I mean, if you're going to be driving up the actual mountains in the snow, then you probably do. If you're just going to be commuting to work, you know, in this in this possible snow, but maybe rain. Then rear wheel drive with snow tires will probably be fine mm -hmm. most of the time. Yeah. Most of the time. Now, nothing German, 35,000 to 45,000 alternatives. Oh, uh, Lexus, like GS. The I, oh, the GS350. Or IS, if you want. IS, IS would be a little cheaper. IS350. For 45, you can get a that GS350 optional Escort. optional all wheel drive, right? Yeah, uh, the F, the, yeah. The, IS does, too? I don't know if the IS does. I'll find out. I don't the know GS if the IS does. does. The GS definitely does, and it's got a great. It has a very good chassis. Yeah, GS three fifty F good Sport. Car. Real not with rear, with rear steer. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. what else? Mm -hmm. Nothing. I mean, there's you can get an IS three fifty with rear, oh with all wheel drive, all -wheel drive? With a, a newer one. So it depends on what year. May it may or may not fit into your price range. Twenty twenty one has it. Yeah. The other thing to look at is the Chevy SS, the end of the runs with the magnetic yeah. ride. Uh, similar handling and chassis dynamics to ATSV, better engine, no Q. no Q. So and more rear seat room if that's yeah, what you're into. I would get that over the ATSV. I, any I day. would too. I'd rather have the SS. Yeah. Um, yeah. But nothing German yeah. leaves le takes out a lot of those all-wheel drive sedans. There's not a lot left. The Japanese don't have a lot of all you Subaru, but I take it this person has considered a Subaru. Living in the Pacific Northwest, yeah. that doesn't—you don't live in the Pacific Northwest and not know about Subaru. Yeah, unless you have tinfoil on all of your windows, right? And you don't look outside. Uh, and nothing German excludes the Audi S3, which would be great. Oh well, such it is. David says, uh, "What have been your favorite podcast episodes from the old house, the old studio, and so far at West Side?" Oof, I don't know if I remember any specific episodes from the old house. I remember I mean, Tales of Greenwich. That is was, when I that brought, was one of the funniest I brought ones. my friend Bam, who is a, a a black comedian from Virginia, to my parents' house in Greenwich, and I had him not say anything about his experience until we got back. I mean, that was pretty fun. That's really funny. I it's enjoyed episode that. Three, maybe uh, people should go episode back and listen. Episode three to it. is it's it that really early? It's, is it that early? Maybe not three, but it's probably first twenty. But I didn't you, realize it was If you that. type in Smoking Tire Tales of Greenwich, you will find it. it that hilarious. was pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, from the old studio. This, Steve Dine at the old house was funny to me because I knew his name, and mm -hmm. then he walked into our home, and he didn't, <laughs> give, he didn't give a shit. He didn't even make fun of it. He's like, okay, what are we going to talk about? And it was like the most informative conversation yeah. we had at that table. Steve was good. Yeah. I liked Steve. The old studio... Dax Shepard came to that That's what studio. I wrote down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Da Dax was like, "Where the fuck are we?" I really like to get him back. Now he's. I like, like that for the turnaround because when he walked in, he's like, "This is where we are," and yeah. then thirty minutes in, he warmed up and yeah. he was like, "Oh, you guys are cool." Okay. Yeah, that was a that fun, was fun one. Mm. Jesse Combs was also funny at this old studio because. Her previous appearance at the house, she had to take a break for a couple years from us because she's like, there were just too many bongs around. Oh, So she right. came to the studio and she's like, look, no bong on the table. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Gordon Murray, probably. At Gordon this, Murray. Even though it was a call-in. great. That was just rad. I really enjoyed talking to him. Yeah. And Bert. Yeah, Bert Kreischer. Bert Kreischer. He was, he was fucking awesome. I really liked doing radio with Bert. He was the fucking man. 
Those are good examples. Um, Andrew N. loves the new content. Uh, it seems like we have we both have fairly similar opinions when it comes to cars. I'd love to know where your opinions differ or where you agree with each other or or where you disagree with each other, either on what you look for in a great car or what cars you had differing opinions on. Zach likes muscle cars more than I do. Yep. I'm not that interested in muscle cars. Literally literally what I wrote down. Yeah. yeah. You wrote down things I did, to this? Because I'm usually typing in things, oh. so it's hard for me to answer on the fly. I didn't realize that this was a written answer to this. Uh... Zach usually likes muscle cars. Uh, Zach has more patience for when things don't work right. I don't, I don't have a lot of patience <laughs> for stuff. Um, That's true. I, I tend to let flaws go by more if the car excites me a lot. Yeah. I'm like, eh, whatever. Who cares about that thing? Yeah. So I'm a little bit more subjective in some areas. Um, yeah, and you. I think I look more look for more, like I care more about build quality than you do. Mm -hmm, I true. really am. A, I've gotten to be a real snob about things being made well and panel gap fit and stuff like that. I think that's a indicator of other things, whereas you can overlook some of that stuff if the car's fun. It's true. Yeah. Especially depending on the price point. You know, if it's under yeah. 50 grand, I don't care. Zach's seating position is also fucking weird. You, uh, the way you set up your seat, I mean, it's I'm more it's torso your, with shorter legs. You, right, you have yeah. shorter leg and longer torso, and I have long legs and short torso. Yeah. So I move the seat back and sit upright, and you move the seat forward and lean back. Yeah. So when we share a car, it's really <laughs> strange. There's a long period of like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, this one is, uh, this is a really complicated one. This one's going to take ten minutes. These are hard. Rich B says, build your perfect car from a amalgamation of parts of all the cars you've driven. Here's the thing, like, my, like, my Porsche is just it. Like, I don't know, I'm not sure, anything else would be a matter of nuance. If I could have a, a manual transmission Ferrari 458 Special, maybe that would be it. That would be fine if you took the six speed in the out of the four thirty and put it mm -hmm. in a four five eight special, you'd be right there. That that would be it. But my Boxster has a crazy motor, a fantastic shifter, a spacious, well laid out, comfortable interior. It's the right size, the right shape, it's the right color. Has two trunks. The materials are great. It's comfortable for twelve hundred miles, but exciting on the mountain. Ceramic brakes. I'm not really sure what else I need. That's, that's a pretty that's strong basically endorsement. Basically, the good. you know that's the car you buy when you've already when you've tried everything else, and you go, well, what is the best thing out there, and how do I make it even better than it comes from the factory? That you just do that, and so I don't. Even if it was a four five eight special with a manual transmission. The Ferrari user interface is trash. My interface in the Porsche makes total sense. That's true. That's true. I, I can't imagine really, a, I actually cannot imagine a better sports car. Uh, if mine was the huh. same exact car, but I didn't have to put the fuel additive shit in it. Oh, that's the, right. I mean, that's the only downside. And even so, it's worth it. If that's what I have to do to drive the perfect car, then that's what I'll do. But that's, what if it had a flat 12? I've driven Testarossas, and a flat 12 is a very effective engine, but it doesn't inspire me. I think the V8 in my 328 is more fun to rev out than the flat 12. It's, fun, it's a very effective engine. It makes makes good torque, and it sounds nice but it it's not that it doesn't have right. the, sh the howl it's like a v12 that you want out of a ferrari yeah mm -hmm. yeah do you have one i would uh ferrari v12 in a mclaren p1 but with a gated shifter oh, so the gordon and, murray car basically yeah pretty much that but i think the p1 i'm never gonna drive a t50 anyway i think the p1 looks a little bit better than mm -hmm. the t50 um so basically a more modern McLaren F1 mm -hmm. is kind of it. But like yeah. that's the sound and then that's the look. I want the, you know, the P1 I think is beautiful. V12s are nice. Like they just sound, I mean, they sound, sound amazing. Good. They sound yeah. fucking amazing. Yeah. So if I'm going to just turducken something and ignore entirely driving dynamics, because if you put a much longer engine in the P1, 
who knows how it would feel, but like, it let's just live in fantasy things. land. Yeah, that's yeah. what I would do. Sure. Dante Casali says, what are your car ergonomic pet peeves? I get bruises on my knees from the doors on the 86. Oh, the yeah. first gen 86 left bruises on my knees. And then when they did the facelift, not the second gen, but just the facelift, they put pads there. Obviously, enough people complained that they it was a problem. And then the second gen, they took the pads away. Yeah. Dummies. The fucking pads back. The pads cost money. The pads, dude, they do cost they do money. They cost money. But that's that was definitely one. The Civic Type R, the new one, not having a lumbar support yep. with otherwise great seats, massive Those fail. Those are exceptional seats, except yeah. for long drives. That's, that's, that's dumb. They just missed that. I don't that's know why. That's just a huge miss. Put the air pump in. I don't care. Yeah. Like, do the cheapest version you can. Yeah. Um, uh, when the blinker stock, when I have to take my hand off the wheel to reach a blinker stock, oh, it's rare. Yeah. yeah. But like, like C8 Corvette, it's a little bit of a stretch. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a pet peeve. Um, the it, droopy side, the droopy side curtain. Oh so yeah. So like when you have to crawl under the thing and you can sit up and your head fits, but the roof droops down. Mm -hmm. So you have to really duck to look out of it or duck. To get underneath it to get out of the car, I hate that. Yeah, the new Toyota, the Super gets that wrong. Mm -hmm. Viper, Viper get it wrong. Yeah, there's some Huracan. Mm. Huracan gets it wrong. R8 doesn't. R8 gets it right. Uh, and if the armrests are really far apart from me, like oh, it's not the, common, but some cars are so big and probably aimed at people that are much larger than me. But like if I have to stretch outward to reach the armrest after like four hours, mm -hmm. it just feels weird on my shoulders. Cup holders where you can't shift anymore. Yeah. Mustang had that. Cup Por holder behind the ship. Porsche 992, manual. If you have a cup in your cup holder of any size, it's right where your hand is supposed to be for shifting, unless it's like a little espresso cup like that. That's why the dashboard cup holders were so brilliant. I liked They're people great. bitch about the dashboard cup holders in the Boxster. I love them. Why do they bitch about them? Because they, they feel kind of flimsy when they That's pop true. out or whatever, but... But they hold. That's what matters. They hold a beverage, yeah. and and my hand can still do this freely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a design. I'll I'll take that design. The second cup holder in the new NSX because it just clips into the the trans tunnel, oh. and then like <laughs> completely intrudes on the passenger's leg room. Like yeah. four inches to the left are gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not good. Uh, Tom Rosenbaum. When you're driving for yourselves, uh, meaning not filming. Uh, what kinds of music do you listen to in the car? For most of the cars uh, that we test, press cars as well as my own cars have Sirius XM. So I listen to Alt Nation, Spectrum, Pearl Jam Radio, Lithium, uh, 44 Hip Hop, sometimes 26 Classic Rock, Classic Rewind. I bounce around when the Billy Joel channel comes back temporarily, I listen to that. I listen to Gaslight Anthem. I listen to Fuel. I listen to Tupac. Uh, I listen to Rise Against a lot. Zach? And uh, podcasts. A lot of uh, Run the Jewels. A lot Run of podcasts. The Jewels. Like, kind of rotate through those. Now, I don't listen to the hip hop stations on Sirius as much because it's. It's for the younger kids with the new artists that I don't. A lot of them are. What's understand. the other one? It's the the classic hip hop. It's, it's like uh, forty seven. Rock the bells. Or yeah, whatever. rock or the bells fly. and fly and fly. And fly. Yeah, I listen to those probably more often. Yeah, yeah. the nineties and two thousands hip hop ones, more often. And then the dollop. Are you garbage? And two bears, one cave, mostly. Our Bobby top three car decades by market. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, the 1990s from Japan. Mm -hmm, totally. That was when they were spending more money on the cars than they were making. And they made some of the funnest stuff they've ever made. Right. Uh, the, 60s muscle cars, U.S. Sure. in the 60s. First half, 2000, uh, or 1995 to 2005 Italians. See, I go 2000 to 2010 because then you get the end of uh, the 550 and mm. the beginning of 458. Because 458 was like oh, okay. 09, sure. just get both. That is a fair assessment. I said 95 to 05 because everything they made was available with a manual. Ooh, that's good. Right. You yeah. can get a Diablo or a Mercy or a Gallardo all in a manual. You could get a 360, a 355, a 360, and a 430 all with a manual. All that's right. A 550 that's and a 575 and a 456 all with a manual. 
You can get uh, every Italian car was available with a manual during that period. That's amazing of time. that they overlapped 355, 360, and mm-hmm. 430 in 10 all years. All in 10 years. Yeah. 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 Because they each one was a successor. In fairness, it was the very first year of the 430. Right. It was 05. But yeah. still. It counts. It totally counts. For, yeah. Yeah. They had, they had shorter product cycles then. And then British. It would have to be. They've had a tough full run. I mean, probably 65 to. Six, or 62 to 72 maybe where they had the db4 db5 and and a little db6 aston martin they had some pretty good triumph stuff in there and it was catering they around had some, yet i think they were well the lotus seven yeah it was so before it was that. catering you had the load some good lotuses probably yeah second late 60s would be good for yeah. british and yeah. if you go that old on something, you don't care that it doesn't feel like a modern Ferrari. Where mm-hmm. like if you go 2011, you know DB9. If you compare it to you know something Italian or German at the time, it's probably going to be a little bit right. behind it. And then you'd have mid 19, yeah, 92, 89 to 99 Germany, where you'd have the. The end of the AMG hammers, mm-hmm. all the way up to the the E forty six, the, the E five, e, e, yeah, no, e, yeah, you just in the E forty six, just in the E thirty nine M five, maybe, you had the E thirty four M five, you had the Porsche nine six four turbo three six, and uh, and all those great nine six fours. Beginning of Boxster. Mm hmm. Hmm. It's a good year. It's a good, good, yeah. good, it's a good, good it's a good fun spread. game. You're like, yeah, which decade? Spread. Yeah. Nick Fell, back again with more Aston Martin questions. Thinking about the early last gen V8 Vantage, would you rather spend the same amount of money on a Mint 4.3 or a decent 4.7? Is more miles actually better? Uh, or should I be looking for the lowest miles possible? Talking about manuals, ignoring the autos. I don't know what they, what else they changed as they expanded the engine, but usually they are improving other things on the car. Yeah. And like, I, I fully admit I don't know all the details of chassis bushing, et cetera, et cetera. But usually in a life cycle, they will improve other parts. So yeah. that's that's where my bet would go is decent 4.7. If what you want is a better driving experience. If what you want is you know something more collectible, then maybe you go mint 4.3. Uh, uh, my, I would tend to say a decent 4.7 because you could probably put either some elbow grease or some money into it to make it great. Good point. The miles I wouldn't be that concerned with. I don't. It's not that more miles is better, but I, I wouldn't buy a car with 2,000 miles on it. I'd rather have a car 15 thousand miles on it than than that if it's got 70,000 that's a that's a different story now you need like major componentry but if you can get a decent 4.7 and then do a paint correction do a deep clean on the interior have the wheels refinished put new tires on it do a major service i your the extra power of the 4.7 is noticeable i don't i forget exactly how much power and torque you got out of the bump to the 4.7 but you do you you can notice it and the the 4.3 sounds great but doesn't really go that fast it makes a lot of noise for not being that fast see the 47 according to this had uh, 436 horsepower i think the 3 i think the 4.3 was not even 400 i think it was like 380 yeah, 385. So yeah, so 40 horsepower, or 40 to 50 horsepower and more torque. I, I would uh, say the, the power bump is worth it, and you can feel it. Right? Yeah, the torque. Uh, well, it's, it's probably more. the it's same. It's probably the same 40 to 50. Yep. I, I can't remember exactly. I'm sorry. But it, but that's a— uh, Oh, 350 a, pound-feet of torque up from 310. 
Yeah, 45 horsepower and 40 torque is abs. That's the difference between my 328 and a 308, and it's a huge difference in a naturally aspirated engine. Yeah, it's a, it's a big difference. So, may if you can get the decent 47 and make it really nice with a little bit of money or elbow grease, I would do that. Uh, okay. I can't read this person's name. Oh, Derek, I'm finalizing details for my Safari WRX and curious on do's or don'ts for your 911 build. Uh, were there any subtle must-haves that someone would not think of normally? My 911 build, the do's was do everything Lee Keen says, and the don'ts were you can't do anything that Lee Keen doesn't <laughs> want you to do. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating at all. You, I handed him the car. I made no decisions, none. Aside from the fabric, well, because because he Keen does a Project, thing, right? They have a thing. They want to thing. kind of control the brand, control what the cars look like, feel like, build them a certain way in terms of quality, but they also have like an aesthetic that they right. want to keep. You only really have you have two choices when you build a, a Keen. Three choices: the color, and they only do one of each color. The interior, and do you want comfort seats or bucket seats? Those are your only options. I wanted to leave the regular stock side mirrors because I plan on daily driving the car and those little rally mirrors are great if you're actually rallying but they're a pain in the ass and Lee was like sorry it's what we do and so so I I, I, I have no advice because I just uh, don't put buckets don't put don't put harnesses in it that's what I would say my real advice is every single time I've put racing harnesses in a, in a car that was street driven I have regretted it immediately Immediately, they're a fucking pain in the dick, and they don't look that cool. And it's also and, somewhat and dangerous. I mean, because, if, yeah. if you're wearing them and you get in a bad accident, your head is moving and your yeah. body's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, and don't put a cage or anything mm -hmm. in that car. Just uh, leave this. Leave the the stock safety equipment intact. That would be my my advice. Uh, Mike Manillo, a few months ago, bought a Mach E GT, influenced heavily by your ownership experience. Best daily I could ask for. What changes or updates do you want to see on a second gen or future facelift? I told this to Mike Levine and to Alan Hall at Ford. I want to see rear wheel drive, long range premium with magnetic ride shocks tuned for comfort and the GT seats. And I want you to call it LX. Cut it, print it, heard it here. That's what I want. The GT, I didn't like the all-wheel drive, and I didn't like how stiff it was. Yeah. Neither of which really improved the driving experience. Rear-wheel drive, long range, but a little bit better body control from a magnetic ride shock versus the kind of cheapy shock that's on there now. And the GT seats with the shoulder supports, those are nice. That's what I would like to see. I have about a month to decide if I want another Mach-E. Oh. Or if I want to get something else. Anything else I would get is significantly more expensive and I don't necessarily want to spend more money but like like I could get a Rivian but it's a lot more money. but it's almost twice the price yeah and I'm not really interested in in that Macan electric not out yet not right not uh Tesla uh, you no <laughs> Although when they got when they started whacking a ton of money yeah. off, I was like, "Whoa, if these things down 10 grand. If these things get down in like the fucking twenties, maybe." Uh, I just saw my first new Prius. Oh, okay. And I went, "Huh? You look at that! Right? It's not bad. It looks pretty good." And I thought maybe I maybe we could try a new Prius, save some cash. Um, I don't know if they've got a plug-in version yet, uh, or if they're all just the regular ones now. But I really like the Mach-E, and I can't, I, I don't know what is on the market that offers everything that that car offers uh, for that price. The Ionic 5 is kind of nice, the Hyundai. I think that's got a pretty cool look, but I haven't really spent much time with one yet. The, the Prius Prime you is a plug-in. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's available yet, but, oh, uh Looks like there's reviews for it, so okay. there is a a plug-in option. We get tomorrow. We get the XC60 recharge. That yeah, Volvo. Volvo. Yeah, which I think has maybe 30 miles of electric range, and then as a hybrid, we'll we'll figure that out later. 
Chris Navio, last five years, what car has surprised you the most and what car was the biggest letdown? These are tough questions because I have to we've driven so many cars and it's hard to like on the fly go through the entire database to find yeah. the biggest pleasant surprise and the biggest letdown. This is why Camisa has a spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> you can search for the word like what the fuck and then you yeah. know, uh, or surprising. I think uh I mean the Elantra N, I know it's a little recent mm -hmm. and but that's how my brain's gonna work. Like that car shocked me with how how fun it is to drive at speed on a track, which I did. And then I also drove it for a week here. And I was like, why is this so comfortable and spacious? I mean, if it wasn't ugly, yeah. it would be like my choice for a front wheel drive car right now. I think Great. I was surprised. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised by, and this is going to sound silly and elitist because these are very expensive cars, three that come to mind. Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid. I was shocked at the amount of performance available and also the technology that allowed you to drive at a pretty solid clip in full electric mode. And it was also the first car that I knew of that could recharge itself we were using the engine. And that type of versatility and flexibility was amazing. I did like 10 laps of a racetrack in that car and finished with more battery power than I started with. Mm on like full kill mode. That was really cool. I was really impressed with the Alpina XB7 and the Maybach GLS, both of which I thought would be kind of stupid, but I found them to be very, very pleasant to drive. And the, especially the Maybach with that hydraulic suspension, I liked that. I thought it was really gimmicky with the bouncy thing, but then I drove it and I was like, oh, this is actually it works great. This is the shit. It's true. Is super, super dope. Uh, that was really cool. This, the Rivian. I was really impressed with the effort. Civic Si. Hmm. The, Civ the Civic Si for under $30,000 is such a nice car. Just nice, well made, spacious, comfortable. Fun to drive, not super powerful, but but quick enough to have a good time, and a lot of Audi influence styling, and and cheap relatively. And that speaking. leads to that's why the uh, new Integra for me was a letdown, because the interior is basically exactly the same mm -hmm. as what you get in a Civic Si. Yeah, and I think the Civic is a better looking car. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> letdown. I mean, probably the EQS Mercedes. I thought was too weird and and I thought uh, they didn't they just it was just a kind of a miss the EQE was better hmm. uh, and I thought the mock EGT was a bit of a letdown too it it just the the things that it did that were supposed improvements over my car didn't make any difference in the real world made very little difference in the canyons, and in fact were hampering the driving experience in many ways. The steering was not good. True. Um, Andy in Colorado, where do you see the Porsche sports car shortage going? Uh, I don't, well, uh, Andy in Colorado, I, I I think is making some implications here. He says, is it due to Porsche needing to sell Macans to keep their fleet average up? Do they want to keep their sports cars Veblen goods? Are they trying to keep desirability high because of the coming shift to EVs? I think that Andy is trying to put certain blames on Porsche, saying they're intentionally holding back the supply of cars, and I don't think that's what they're doing. The 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 way the fleet average works it's not based on units sold it's based on products offered so like when Aston Martin did the Signet mm -hmm. they got they got fleet credit for offering that product even if very few people bought it it's not based on the number of units sold uh, the 911 is built in Stuttgart and the Macan is built in Leipzig so the 
if the, the production process of one is not necessarily related to the production process of the other. I also don't think people are cross shopping those two where they go, oh, there's no 9-11 available. I guess I'll buy a Macan then. Yeah. Like, uh, they, uh, they're, they're buying, and pe- they're selling a lot of Macans. That's, I think, their biggest selling product. Right? It is. So, and so I, I think the, I think Porsche is building as many 9-11s as they can build. They may be only abe- available. There's a, there's a big holdup in paint to sample. The, the, there's, there's, you'd be shocked at how small of a thing can hold up the production process of a car. Suppliers are still really an issue. A lot of shit comes from the Ukraine, bro. Carbon ceramic and gold for semiconductors and like, there's a bunch of shit that comes from the Ukraine and that, that people can't get or comes from Russia over there. And there's a lot of, there's a, there's a bunch of issues of shortages of stuff in Germany that are industry wide. And so while there is a limited number of cars that can do the paint to sample program, while there is a limited number of cars for GT, the GT car program, I think if you're just talking about Carreras and Carrera S's and Boxsters and Caymans, I think Porsche is building as many of those as they can as they can build and sell. I don't think they're intentionally holding back the supply of any of those cars. I think there are uh, supply chain issues. I think demand is very high, and um, and I don't think they're doing anything nefarious on a corporate level. Yeah, Chris, I I don't think um, I could be wrong, but I don't I don't think they are based on what I know about. Por- Nobody at Porsche has ever indicated to me that they they need to sell fewer 911s in order to. They're they're part of Volkswagen. They they they. They're they're a big company. They're not. It's not like, it's not. They're, they're not going to sell fewer cars to keep the demand high. No, I mean they're also publicly traded now, right? Mm-hmm. So they need. I mean they have a board. They need to sell yeah. more things than ever usually. Christian Pelfrey, what automotive documentary would you make if you had the production studio budget to make one? Ooh. Hmm. Interesting question. Uh. I mean, oof. That's really hard. That's very it's hard. Like, like, what? What person do we know what that the story, story has been told? Yeah. We usually hear about these people because their story is told. Mm-hmm. I think a really cool, if you could, th- there was a guy who made a documentary about the early 20th century and racing in Los Angeles when there was actually like 25 or 30 racetracks all over L.A., be very difficult because the assets are minimal from that period it's a lot of still photographs it's very little action but it it would be cool or or uh maybe the peking to paris you know the crazy peking to paris event where like there's a dollop about it where like a bunch of people died um I mean, documenting an event is very cool. Like, uh, what's it? The Moroccan rally, the Mongol rally, where they drive mm. from England to Morocco, or I'm um, sorry, to uh, Mongolia. Um, you know, if you had like a billion dollars to follow each team because they're out for like a month sometime, yeah. like that would be interesting. Uh, I think the Ariel Adam, if they, if you did like a 16 minute documentary, because that about the development of the Ariel yeah, I mean, Adam. <clears throat> the guy who first drew it was it like an engineering student, I think, and he drew it, and his professor saw the idea and went, "Do you want to start a business?" And like. <laughs> That's really cool. And now they're still making fourth generation Ariel Adam now. Mm-hmm. So that'd be an interesting story. Uh, Jake Shores, after the Smoky 600, would you be willing to share the route? <clears throat> yes, I will share the route. Um, I will say that I will share the route, but it is possible if you're just going by yourself to make a better route than I am making because I am restricted by several hard points. We are staying at these hotels, we're eating at these restaurants, and I make the route in between those places. And so my route has to be done within certain constraints. And if you are not constrained by those things and you could stay anywhere you want and eat anywhere you want, you could probably make a better route than I've got. Having said that, I will happily share. Um, Paul says, has a collision prevention system ever saved you from getting into an accident? Uh, I would say that auto emergency braking has a couple of times if I've been slightly distracted and someone in front of me has slammed on their brakes. Mm-hmm. I would say yes. 
Yeah, yeah. it has for me too. Yeah. I was backing out of my driveway a month ago, and it like it stopped me and saw cross traffic that I didn't see for some reason at nighttime. So every now and then, yeah, we are imperfect. Seth Allen, I have a Chevy Cruze Eco that I bought for cheap money to build into a fun HPD e car. I don't understand that concept, but okay, sure. I chose it was because it was cheap, and my daily is a Cruze diesel. Did I screw up by buying the same thing I daily, or could that be a benefit at the track? Um, I don't know. I don't see how it could be. It could be a screw up because you don't get a different experience necessarily. If you're used to a, you know, maybe you want to drive something a little different for fun than than you drive every day. Right. Uh, it, like, is it enough of a vacation from your car when you get in your track car and you're like, I feel like I'm going to work? I feel like I drove a track prepped cruise once. I'd, someone built it and I drove it. I, I don't. I have a vague recollection of it, but I don't really remember. I mean, the good news is you'll be in extreme. You should be extremely familiar with like the heel toe and the pedal placement, and how the shifter feels. Like you should be the best downshifter <laughs> on that track that day. Because you don't have any excuses, but yeah. and maybe you can part share a little bit if I don't know, like a knuckle breaks on the race car, you can pull one off of your daily. But uh, I think you missed out by not diversifying your experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I would probably would have bought something different. I, I just they're okay, but if I thought of what's a fun car for HPDE for cheap, a front wheel drive. And an eco, no less. A front-wheel drive, economy-oriented version right. of that car not is, a hot is not what I would be thinking of. Uh, but maybe my idea of fun is different from his. I would have gone with something maybe rear-wheel drive. Um, you know, Miata is the obvious answer, but maybe something else. But but whatever. Uh, Richard James. A couple episodes, we were talking about the current Alpha lineup and said we didn't like the two-liter models. Uh, I was surprised because they generally have a good reputation in terms of draw quality and fun factor in their class. What don't you like about them? I didn't like the old-school zingy nature of the turbo. When I drove it and I had to merge out of traffic and I and I smashed it, it was I thought I was going to get rear-ended because mm. you, you, it takes a long time to spool the turbo. This was in... When they first came out, I don't know if they've revised that engine since, but and that was in the Stelvio two liter. I, I I never was motivated enough to drive the Julia two liter after that. So. I've never driven one either. I've heard good things about the Julia two liter, but I've never driven one. I Johnny just, se- leased yeah. one and seemed to like it. Yeah, but, that's true. But the one I drove, I thought was good once you got the engine going. But off the line to scoot out into traffic, it was real laggy, and I didn't like that. It's like an old-school turbo engine. Old-school turbo engine, yeah. Which in a crossover was like, "Mm, whatever. Maybe it had like a T-76 on it or something, you know? Huge turbo charger. Sure. Uh, Bonus round of the new cars currently on sale. What is the most fun or generally satisfying normal car you've tried? I just said the the Civic Si, which, I mean, even though it's the sporty version, I think that— that was a very satisfying car. The Mazda 3 Touring. That was like Those a really were nice, nice mm-hmm. inside, good-looking car. You know, not not a great transmission, not the most exciting engine, but a good all-around car. Yeah, those were that was okay. I liked that car too. That was it felt it felt uh felt a little, a little more, more premium, brand, a little yeah. more premium than I would have expected from from them. That was good. Yeah, that's a good choice. Uh Aaron Dyer, I'm looking at some options for what would probably be my last internal combustion car. Uh, what, based on the EVs and hybrids we have right now, what driving experience do you expect will be the least replicable in an upcoming era of electrified vehicles? Oh, well, I mean, none of them. There's, there's, there's no EVs that are that feel like gas cars. They just they just don't. The, the real question is, is that he gets to the point here. Are there dailyable options that would be practical enough for daily driving duties but fun weekend cars once retired from daily duties in a few years? Yes, mm-hmm. a bunch. Pick your 
Pick your Japanese Pick thirty-five thousand dollars Japanese car. I mean, yeah, a Launcher C- N Civic, Civic SI Civic sure. C- Type R. Anything with a manual gearbox. Yeah. Anything. Well, you, that, they're, they're not. Although the I read uh, yesterday that two years ago manual cars were 0.9 percent of all the new cars sale. It's up to 1.2. Oh, it's on its way back, baby. That's a 33 percent increase. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, look you, at it that way. If you really wanted to uh, to juice the numbers, you'd yeah. say they're up by 33 percent. Yeah, that is a that is a uh, uh, but. There are no gas cars that feel like electric cars, and there are no electric cars that feel like gas cars. So buy the experience you want to have now, I think is the best answer. I, I without, a, without a budget, without any other things, it's too broad of a question to answer directly. But stick shift, because there aren't going to be any stick shift EVs, and if they are, they won't be good. Anonymity wants us to know, yes, the Interior's uh, Chiseta video did it drop, yes. Uh, TC, do we plan on testing the BMW i4 M50? Not really. I, I, I think the SEO on that car is probably dead. Uh, if we do an electric BMW in the future, it'll probably be the 7 Series mm-hmm. uh, before anything else. Because the M50's been out for It's been out a for a while. Now, so yeah. that, it would really hurt the algorithm. Uh, how have the Dunlops been on my 718 Spider? Well, aside from getting a, a nail in one and having to have that patched, they've been fine. They've been better than I expected them to, considering I did not have a lot of confidence in them from the beginning. I haven't driven them in the very cold, but they were actually okay in the wet. They're not too loud in the dry, and they seem to be holding up uh, just fine. They're they're not bad, not bad. Uh, Pause for one second, it had a broadcast error. So oh, really? Cover. So what happened? We cut, we cut. Speed? No, it just said broadcast error. You know, what do I want to do? Keep recording, stop recording, recover broadcast. So I chose recover broadcast. Oh. And I'm going to hold my hand up as a marker. So marker! I can see when I pop up. <clears throat> I mean, we're near the end, so we're still recording. Okay. So. Uh, Ivan Capote says, what is your take on manufacturers putting their sports sub-brand names on EVs? Uh, Is it sacrilege to screw everything those names stand for? I recommend, Ivan, you go watch my EQE AMG review in which I explore that very topic. I do think it's very weird uh, to put those uh, sporty monikers on electric vehicles, Uh, but it's kind of just where we are in the world right now, mm-hmm. unfortunately. I hate to say it, but it's going to be a thing where it's like, just get used to it. But uh, I do not find the EQE AMG to be really worthy of the AMG name. I thought it was pretty unexciting most of the time. I mean, the brands aren't going to throw away 30, 50, 80 years worth of like brand cachet yeah. because we don't like it. Yeah. So it's just that they're not going to do it. So we just have to, you know, settle in and that's how it's going to be. Yeah. Light bias seems like single clutch manuals are universally hated, meaning the single clutch automated manuals. Why do we still see them show up occasionally? Recent example being the AMG one. Uh, isn't that the formula one gearbox? Uh, I believe so. I think the reason it's because formula one still uses them. Formula one doesn't use dual clutches. And the point of the AMG one is to be the Formula One-based powertrain. So they probably did it for that reason. The Valkyrie also did it because I don't think there's a dual clutch that will handle that much power. That's the other thing is there's dual clutches often can't handle as much power, as, or to- especially torque yeah. as a single clutch is. Yeah, uh, unless you want to license it from Porsche. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, that. <laughs> Which most people don't. Uh, Dave from Minnesota says, what's my favorite road trip snack? Is there something you never eat unless you're in a car? Mine is Twister licorice sticks. I'm pretty good at not snacking so much on the road anymore. I used to eat a lot of road trip snacks, like beef jerky and peanuts and stuff like that. And I started getting 
heartburn. Mm. And I was like, I just need to not do this anymore. I went to see a doctor. Turns out peanuts and other like hard nuts, all nuts are hard, but some are harder than others. Peanuts and beef jerky give me crazy because my stomach has to work really hard to break them down. Oh, okay. You know what I like? So peanuts, bad peanut butter, fine. Because uh, they've already done half the work in the blender. Right. So I don't have a lot of road trip snacks anymore. I know that's a boring answer. I love a great cup of coffee. I'll brew myself a, a nice, you know, Yeti full of uh, good coffee with oat milk. I don't, I don't fuck with real milk anymore. I love, love my oat milk. And if I, if I really, really need something, I'll go uh, uh, Ritz. Peanut oh, butter yeah. and jelly. Oh, now they do a peanut butter and they jelly Ritz now. I didn't yeah, know that. them fucking shits. Are wow, good. they're good. Six pack, not the eight, not the king size. Got to, got to keep it mellow. I try to not eat too shitty in the car, but I also will only eat fast food on the road. I will not mm. ever go to a fast food restaurant in Los Angeles if I'm home because there's always a better alternative. Yeah, but I'll eat like I'll eat In and Out, burgers, no fries, or I'll eat Burger King. I really like Burger King. Really? Yeah. Man. The Burger King Whopper to me is a really well executed burger that I like very much. I don't think I've had one in like 20 years, but I think you should try it again. If it, the, the Whopper, the, whatever mayo sauce they put on, I don't need that. Yeah, that's but just oh, the Whopper is a well executed uh, burger. I okay, think. it's it's that. So that, I'll only eat that when I'm on the road. I'll I do McDonald's on breakfast when we're on the road. It's like because sometimes you're in a place that has three options and two are gas stations. Right. So like, well, this has an eggish thing in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Chris Navio say, uh, all the reviews of the new GT3 RS say the paddle shifters feel more mechanical because a magnet is built into the paddle. Did you notice this? And if so, do you think more manufacturers will adopt this technology? I did notice it, and it's not on all the GT3 RSs. It's only on the Weissock pack cars. The non-Weissock pack cars have regular paddle what shifters. What does the magnet do? I don't. I didn't really stop to ask how the magnet works, but it makes an, a much, if you go watch my video, it's a real noticeable and engaging clack, like a click. Like, you know how if you, when we went to shoot those guns, the difference between the good gun and the great gun and how much nicer that was? Yeah. That's what this is. It's It's just something about, I don't know what it is that the magnet does, but something about it makes the paddle shifters feel uh, really good. Hmm. I wonder, I, I, I was trying to find something about it and there's an aftermarket company that makes like a magnetic version, but yeah. I'm, I'm curious what the mechanism is like. Yeah, I don't, the I don't know and I did, but I just, well, they had a non sock car and they had a sock car at the launch and only the sock car. Maybe had instead of having like a spring and electric switch, you're pulling a magnet away could be. And like that's the tension and then so it's very crisp. Oh. Like it breaks like a, almost like a gun. Like it, yeah. the tension breaks and then it clacks back together. Oh I don't yeah, know. that could be. That could be. That would be that's a good one. Yeah. It's a magnet that pulls the paddle back. That like resets it. Yeah, uh, that could be it. I don't know. That's but it that's But it cool. was you cool. You could hear it in the video. Like you, you can. could hear it. Yeah, it's a very yeah. satisfying paddle. I was a fan of it. Uh and I did notice it. I still think McLaren's rocker paddles are the best because you yeah. can go up or down with either hand. So cool. That's, and it feels really good. It does. Like it's got both. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, and I got a bunch of messages about this one from Unknown. Uh, so wanting a list of the books that John suggested to me about small businesses. And one is The E-Myth Revisited. One is the four-hour work week, um, and not everything in the four-hour work week. Uh, uh, I have to go back and look on Should my Should you read bookshelf. that one again? Because you work more than four hours a week. I know. <laughs> I, that was like, there was some great fucking advice in there, yes. and then I didn't take it. There's also a lot of stuff in there It's like, you can work for hours if you design your business to be this certain thing. Sure. So that's different. Yeah. yeah. If I if if I only did West Side and didn't do the media stuff, I probably could 
do that actually. It was really good stuff like train your customers and coworkers that you only check your email twice a day. Mm. Like put in your email signature, I check my email at 8.30 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. A- excuse me, 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. And if, you, if you're emailing me in between or outside of those times, you'll get a response at the next one. And like that was a, that was a good one. It was just like how to like, a lot of it was, some of it was about like outsourcing yourself, which I can't obviously do, but other parts of it were about how to train the people you work with subtly to not expect you to jump at their needs all the time. And that was that was good. Um, there's a couple more. The E Myth was a is a good one. I recommend that one. I have I'll have to go back and look, and maybe next show I'll bring some of those books in, and we can do show and tell. Uh, that's all for us today. We got actually two good shows this week. Steph Papadakis is coming in tomorrow afternoon. Uh, he'll be here in studio. And then Mike Spinelli. Is Spinelli in studio or calling in? In studio. Ms. Spinelli's in studio. Mm-hmm. Always great radio with Mike Spinelli. Is that That's Tuesday, Wednesday or Tuesday, Thursday? Tuesday, Wednesday, right? I think it's Tuesday, Wednesday. Correct. All right, so two two shows and uh, three shows in three days. Steph Papadakis, uh, amazing um, race car builder, uh, will be here tomorrow, and then Mike Spinelli, uh, formerly of the Drive, now he's doing some IMSA broadcasting, and uh, we'll see what the fuck else he's doing uh, on Wednesday. Thanks everyone. Thank you to our patrons for submitting your great questions. Good round of questions today, and we'll see you guys tomorrow, same time, same place.